Okay, I think we're a couple of minutes past two o'clock, so let's get started. Um, hi, uh, welcome to today's Data Access and Discovery webinar. Um, my name is Ruth, I'm part of the communications team at Health Data Research um, UK, um, and I am your host for today's session. So thank you very much for coming, coming along um, and welcome. Um, before we get started with today's guest speakers, um, I just have a couple of uh, housekeeping, housekeeping things to mention. Sorry, my keyboard stuck then and I couldn't change the uh, change the page. Um, these are our values as a as a organisation, so please be mindful of them today during today's um, session. We are uh, recording the webinar today and we will make it available for you um, afterwards along with other um, resources. We also have a Q&A function for you to post questions to our panel for the end section. Um, and please use the, the chat for um, anything else that you might need. Um, okay, so today's um, agenda. So very shortly, I'll hand over to um, Eleanor from CPRD um, and she will uh, take us through um, CPRD's data service, including its new um, ethnicity records. Um, we'll then hear from my colleague Paula, who will give us an update on some of the diversity in data, diversity in data work that's coming out of the um, Alliance. And then at the end, we'll have time for some questions from the audience, where we will be joined by a couple of um, additional panel panel members. Um, Ashley from Swansea University, and he also um, is co-chair of one of the. Uh, diverse, diversity and data special interest groups um, we'll, and we'll also have Mike um, from CPRD as well. Um, but just before I hand over to Eleanor for our first talk, we have a couple of questions for everybody. Um, so I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. screen. Bear with me two seconds while I bring up our polls. Okay, first question. Here we go. Give you all a few moments to give us your answers. Okay, great. I think that's pretty much most people. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Share the results quickly. Next poll, one more, and then we will get started properly. Oh, maybe you already got question two. No, no one can see question two. Oh, that's annoying. Okay, I'll fix it for the end. Um, in the meantime, I will hand over to uh, uh, Eleanor. Thanks so much. Hello, everyone. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, fantastic. Um, hi, my name is Eleanor Axon, and I am a senior researcher at the Clinical Practice Research Data Link, or CPRD. We're based at the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency. Um, and I'm really excited to be chatting about ethnicity and our database today and our new um, data set offering related to ethnicity. Uh, there we go. Uh, just a brief overview of what I'm gonna be talking about. Um, I'm gonna go over what ethnicity looks like in primary care and in secondary care in the UK. Um, I'm gonna talk a bit about our new ethnicity records data sets. And I'm gonna have a look at the representativeness of the CPRD databases in terms of ethnicity. And at the end, I'll very briefly give an overview of CPRD in general, um, for those of you who answered that you weren't familiar with CPRD. Uh, so just a little bit of background. We all know ethnic inequalities in health have been widely documented and that addressing these inequalities is a priority for public health. And it's important to understand these inequalities to adapt health services, to address the needs of underserved ethnic groups. And 
understanding these and addressing these supports the democratization of research. Um, and so to help address these inequalities, reliable and accurate ethnicity data is required. And also health data that is representative of the population is required as well. So ethnicity is recorded in primary care and in secondary care in the UK. Um, in the past, from 2006 to 2011, ethnicity recording was actually incentivized by the NHS in primary care. So GP practices were rewarded for recording ethnicity of their patients um, during that time period. The national distributions for ethnicity in the UK, um, the gold standard is of course the census, which unfortunately, <laughs> and fortunately, because it's massive, only takes place every 10 years. There are some additional sources of ethnicity data for the UK or just England in some cases um, that are provided from the Office for National Statistics. Um, so within CPRD, we have 82% of usable ethnicities. So that's ethnicity other than unknown, um, recorded for currently registered patients. So those are patients that are active in their GP practice right now. Um, and we have 64% uh, usable ethnicity recorded for all acceptable patients. So those are patients that don't have strange um, data mishaps such as a, a birth date that is improbable or those sorts of things. Um, so a large swathe of patients in our database do have ethnicity recorded. There are various levels of ethnicity recording and they go from the lower level which is which can be quite um, detailed. Um, so it can be something um, as specific as Nigerian or something as broad as Latin American. Um, the middle level is the census categorizations. In the UK, this is um, typically the harmonized version has 18 uh, ethnic categories within it. And then there's the higher level classification, which is the broadest classification. Um, there's typically six categories, so white, mixed, Asian, black, other, and the sixth is unknown. Um, and the highest level categorization is most often used in health research. Um, and it's typically uh, the easiest one to apply because it's not different between the UK nations, like the census categories are different in each of the four devolved nations. So the CPRD ethnicity records are a new data set um, that have been created using an algorithm. This algorithm has been designed to make the best use of available ethnicity data within primary and secondary care to maximize the number of patients with an ethnic categorization and to provide a standardized procedure for determining, <laughs> determining ethnicity categorization using the CPRD databases. Uh, currently, the ethnicity record provides ethnicity at the highest categorization, so there's six categories. And it draws on ethnicity data from all available sources. So those are the primary care databases, CPRD Gold and Aurum, and all of the secondary care databases, the hospital episode statistic databases. Using the ethnicity categories divide, defined by the ethnicity record will allow for easier replication, generalization, and comparison of research that uses ethnicity um, from the CPRD databases. If everyone uses a standardized methodology for determining ethnicity, it makes it easier to compare across different studies over time. 
So the algorithm that underlines these data sets is um, a hierarchical algorithm, and it's designed for patients with multiple and or conflicting ethnicity recordings in the data. So patients that have only a single ethnicity record are assigned to the appropriate category based on that single record. However, the patients that have multiple records or conflicting records within the data are assigned an ethnic category based on the hierarchical algorithm, which uses um, a hierarchy based on frequency of recording, multiplicity of recording, the timing of recording, the data source for that record, and the population level frequency of ethnicity. The algorithm also pr prioritizes the non-other categorization. Um, and of course, there are limitations and caveats associated with each of the decisions made by this algorithm and changing those um, prioritizations of the algorithm would of course change the output of the algorithm. Uh, we are currently doing some more work to assess what changing the priorities of the algorithm, how much that actually affects the final ethnic categorization for patients. Um, preliminary data suggests not a whole lot actually. So that should be coming out hopefully early next year. Um, the algorithm does not impute missing ethnicity. Um, that's very important. People tend to think that it does, but it does not. If there is unknown ethnicity, that person is assigned unknown ethnicity. Um, and again, we also do take into account patients that have opted out of sharing their ethnicity data. There are specific codes that indicate that a patient has declined or refused to share their ethnicity with a healthcare provider. People with those specific codes for declined or refused are that we wipe their ethnicity data history and we assign them a value of unknown ethnicity. This is to respect their decision to opt out of sharing their ethnicity data. So looking at these CPRD databases, when we use um, ethnicity data from both CPRD and HES, we see that there is suitable representation and a similar distribution of all ethnic categories compared to the UK population. So in this figure, what you can see um, at the top is the CPRD Gold database um, with supplemented ethnicity data from hospital. Um, B is CPRD ARM database. C is gold and orum combined. And lastly, D is the UK census 2011 distribution. Um, at the time that we did this work, that was the most recent data. We are currently updating based on the 2021 census. Um, we're a little held up by the fact Scotland has not released their data yet because their census was a year late. Um, so we're waiting on Scotland basically. Um, but as you can see, based on the 2011 census, the distribution of ethnicity within CPRD is comparable to the UK. Um, it does have a smaller proportion of white ethnicity, which is the blue, um, compared to the UK um, in 2011, which is what I say on this slide. I got ahead of myself. Um, so CPRD and has ethnicity drawn from those sources was less white compared to the UK. However, when we compared to England only, um, within England, the Office for National Statistics has released ethnicity distributions for the country of England um, that are more recent than the 2011 census. Um, those you can see in E and F of this figure. 
Um, so E was an experimental ethnicity distribution that the Office for National Statistics did in 2019. And F is NHS Digital, which is now NHS England, um, their ethnic distribution for England based on the GDPPR HES um, database. And what we can see is that compared to these more recent um, ethnicity distributions, the distribution of ethnicity within the CPRD databases is in line with the most recent um, distribution from NHS Digital. Finally, this last table, um, all of these tables uh, you can access and see very nicely in the publication. So there is a link to the DOI on these slides. Um, this table just shows the ethnicity distributions broken down by data source. Um, and you can look at that uh, in the publication. But some limitations. Uh, with using ethnicity and researching ethnicity is that there are different ethnicity classification systems that are used by various entities, including um, the devolved nations. Each devolved nation has their own ethnic categories. Um, they are different on the census for each nation. Um, and obviously other data sources beyond the census use a multitude of categorizations. There are outdated categorizations, there are less granular categorizations, and there are very granular categorizations. Um, so the non-standardized policies and procedures for collecting this data um, makes it very hard to then analyze this data at an aggregate or higher level. Um, some of this work, um, the work that went into creating the ethnicity records data sets um, endeavored to do some of this work for you in that we take the data in all its various forms and we harmonize it into one categorization that you can just look at and say, right, this is the ethnic category. All the hard work behind it um, has been done for you. Um, hospital data is only available for patients in England, um, at least related to CPRD. Um, this could, of course, lead to systematic bias um, in the derived variables when you compare English to non-English practices. And the algorithm is not yet validated. Um, we are working into working on that. Um, and hoping to be able to do that work in the future. Um, but at the moment, it remains unvalidated. And so there's that limitation as well. Um, so briefly, just a little bit on CPRD more generally. So CPRD is the Clinical Practice Research Data Link. It has over 60 million patient lives. So that's cradle to grave um, for 60 million patients. And over 16 million of those patients are currently registered, which means actively alive, contributing to data to the database. Um, it's representative in terms of age, sex, and ethnicity in, to the UK population. It's used by more than 20 countries worldwide and has resulted in over 3,000 peer reviewed publications. We have 30 years, over 30 years, experience of health, electronic healthcare record data collection. And we comp and we have 90% of UK healthcare consultations occur in primary care. So using primary care data for health research is really important because a lot of healthcare happens in primary care. Primary care data 
Um, we have over 4 billion consultations within the CPRD databases. These include things from diagnosis and symptoms, drug exposure, referrals, laboratory tests, vaccination history, and demographic data. We are a UK government source. We provide support services for retrospective and prospective studies in public health and clinical studies. Services are based on the longitudinal primary care data, which we link to other data sets. The medium follow-up in our database is 10 years, and over a quarter of the patients within our database have over 20 years of follow-up. We represent one in four GP practices in the UK. Our um, data is collected daily, and we do in-house data quality checks to ensure that it is the highest quality data that we're putting out there. We can extend the scope of your research by linking primary care data to various other data sources, including secondary care data from hospital episode statistics. We can link to Office for National Statistics mortality data, death data. We can link to small area data, so this includes uh, socioeconomic status, rural urban classifications, there's cancer data and COVID-19 data available as well. Um, so if you have any queries uh, related to using CPRD data or you want to inquire as to whether CPRD data would be good for your research, um, please feel free to contact us uh, via the inquiries at cprd.com email and we look forward to working with you and I believe that's all yet so I will stop sharing my screen and pass over to Paula uh, to discuss HDR UK and their work thank you so much Eleanor over to Paula Thank you, and thank you for inviting me today. I'm going to share my screen in a second. And just please, if you can confirm that you're seeing my screen. Yes, we can see it. Brilliant, thank you. Brilliant, thank you so much, Eleanor. Very, very interesting um, uh, presentation and an update on, on your work, and actually very relevant to what I'm going to talk about that hopefully will address some of those um, um, considerations around standardization. So I'm the head of Alliance at Health Data Research UK, and I'm going to talk about uh, a particular working group that we've been um, convening in the past few months, uh, which is around diversity in data. And I'm speaking on behalf of the chairs of the special interest group, uh, who are Kamlesh Kunti from the University of Leicester, and Ashley Akbari, who's here today uh, from the Swansea University as well. Um, so happy to answer any question afterward. So just in case um, there are some people on the call who don't know Health Data Research UK, I have a very, very brief uh, introduction on what we do. And just to say that we are an independent charity organization supported by uh, UK public funders mostly, and some programs are funded through uh, non-UK funders, such as the Bill and the Gate Foundation. We are the UK Institute for Health Data Science, and we are entering a new phase um, for, for the Institute. And we work across academia, healthcare, industry, and charities, and very much with the patients and the public. We are a federated institute, let's say, and we have many locations from across the UK, and we have a really strong four nations focus. This is our mission there, just for people to know, but it's really to um, unite the UK health data assets and improve people's lives through discovery and research. So um, what we're doing is really working across the UK with several stakeholders to inform policies and inform uh, setup and development of a research data infrastructure. So these are, these are the three, let's say, strategic priorities around accelerated trustworthy data. And so really working in, on assembling the infrastructure and services for uh, supporting that. 
Empowering researcher is a priority in that we, um, we work with scientists and researchers from the UK, and we also provide some use cases for uh, using the infrastructure that we develop. And then we promote partnerships. So obviously, when we talk about health data, there's um, a quite uh, a need for uh, working in partnership with all of the decision, decision makers and, uh, and the, the organizations who really play a key role uh, in this space. So as we're talking about diversity, um, this is uh, the organization diversity and inclusion policy. And I just mentioned this one because we are trying to embed diversity and inclusion across the different programs that we, um, we run. So the data diversity part is really relevant to uh, increasing representativeness of data that we use for research and innovation. So very much what we've been talking about today. And then perspectives is about listening to different perspectives and diverse perspectives from the population. Training and capacity is about diverse skills and background in people that are trained. And then people as an organization, it is important that we build a diverse workforce. So we have several programs and projects ongoing on this uh, area, and you might have come across the Black Internship Program, or you might have come across um, the public and patient engagement um, involvement um, uh, work that we've been doing uh, to reach out to underserved communities. But today we're talking about the UK Data Research Alliance working group that is specializing on diversity in data. And... Um, the Alliance is a partnership of data custodians and health research organizations who are really uh, committed to, to develop and establish best practice for the ethical use of UK health data. CPRD is one of our um, first Alliance members actually to join when we were set up in 2019. And the idea is really that we look at how we can drive standardization uh, for all of the life cycle of, of the data, let's say, and implement and facilitate organizations to implement standards. And so again, in the diversity, if we talk about coding, how do we implement um, uh, those standards across organizations? And this is just a snapshot to say that we have a diverse um, group of Alliance members. And so thinking about implementation of standards, we can work with all of these groups and see how we can facilitate um, uh, the change across their own organizations. And so just very, very quickly, um, the three things that we do with those organizations is, first of all, to build communities and convene and coordinate and make sure that we bring people together so that we uh, avoid uh, duplication of efforts. Shaping standards is really agreement across the standards. So when we talk about the four nations, we are trying to streamline as much as possible and achieve agreement there and driving adoption of best practice, again, uh, via, via different means that could be also incentivizing change. We have four areas that we work on um, in particular, and one is around technology and tools, one is around trust and transparency, one is around usability and data standards. So again, when we talk about standards for data, that would fit there. And then capacity building. We need to make sure that um, we help um, creating the, the right workforce and also the trained people who can work with the infrastructure. So the Alliance have already um, set up and kind of uh, uh, produced some outputs that different Alliance members are taking forward. And we normally publish these papers and then we work on implementation with the different organizations. Um, this is just a list to show you that we have quite a few working groups that are active at the moment. And the one that we've been talking about today and that uh, that is almost coming to an end in, in terms of uh, the convening power is the diversity in data. Um, so the diversity in data working group was uh, set up by the Alliance uh, during the pandemic, let's say. Um, obviously, during the pandemic, you will have seen that there were a lot of uh, um, considerations around um, the ethnic inequalities in, um, in during COVID-19 with ethnic minority groups in particular. So that was really raised by the Alliance members and, and people saying that actually um, no, there's no recording or ethnicity data across the piece. Some people do record that information, some people don't. And so there was really a need for uh, a better analysis of this data, especially in, in a situation like the pandemic. But obviously the COVID-19 was just an example of what can happen in terms of inequalities. So the Alliance called for improving quality of ethnicity coding and standardization and to help increase representativeness. 
We started with ethnicity, but um, the, obviously we are very conscious that there are other protected characteristics that we can consider. And that is something that we are thinking about whether we should reinstate a working group that is looking at different characteristics. But just to say the main output of uh, this working group, very much thanks to Ashley and Kamlesh who have driven this um, uh, throughout the whole period. We had um, two initial alliance meetings before starting, then three sessions online and one session in person. And we have been looking at in particular by the conversations that we were having about improving recording of ethnicity data. So Eleanor mentioned that there is this recording at different levels, but if we're talking about different organization, everybody does it slightly in a different way. And while in we have the census, for instance, in England, there is the consideration about the four nations. So we also talk about um, the role of the healthcare professionals and the public trust, because obviously the information that is provided by people um, is, is what we have available. And so understanding how we can improve the transparency and understanding how we can talk to people about why data is really needed um, is one of the things that we should look at. At the moment, we have drafted um, a, staff to um, sorry, a set of recommendations to improve recording of ethnicity data. We've been now writing the paper and we want to outline those recommendations to some of the Alliance members who are key decision makers, but also others who can play a role and actually enact on some of these uh, recommendations and changes. So uh, some of the challenges explored, and I think Eleanor a little bit hinted on these as well. Um, there is a bit of a poor data quality and systematic biases that were highlighted, incomplete coding and inconsen inconsistent use of codes, and the recording of patients from minority ethnic groups was actually very uh, variable. And then there were variation in data collection processes, and that's why we've been looking at this in particular in our recommendations. And those variations might be due to individual factors, organizational factors, or policy factors. Um, we talked about um, the uh, ONS categories. So we, we looked at England and the situation in England with, with the 18 categories that the Office for National St Statistics have been working on. That is the gold standard. But again, around the applications of those categories and whether we go high level, middle level, low level, as Eleanor mentioned, is quite variable. So can we, as an alliance, drive at least an harmonized approach or at least provide a guidance to how to go about it? So this is very small on your screen probably, but uh, it is a, a summary of the emerging set of recommendations that we are summarizing in, um, in the paper that we'll uh, hopefully publish in the next few months. And one recommendation is around increasing consistency in ethnicity data collection across the four nation. The second recommendation is about standardization and categorization, providing guidance um, to, on the use of, for instance, the ONS uh, 18 categories. Communication and transparency is one of the third, is the third recommendations and is about uh, um, making a concerted effort to ensure the value of collecting this data is articulated, but also we provide transparency around it. And then guidance for healthcare professionals, because we know that the GPs, the clinicians do play a key role when they collect this information. So there is a need for guidance and for a, a consistency in those processes as well. And finally, considerations around data linkage. Sometimes you can enrich the data that you have and the information you have by data linkage. So can we uh, move towards that and work with the NHS uh, settings and the secure data environment to enable that? So um, that's, those were the recommendations that the Alliance is proposing, and we'll refine them. Uh, but obviously, to connect the dots, we need to acknowledge that there is a lot of work uh, out, out there. And I think it is crucial that we work together with some, some collaborators on the different aspects. So understanding patient data, working on the public perception, the government and the census, obviously, on the application is something that we need to do uh, together. Then we have the NHS long-term plan. So, for instance, the guidance is something that we can do together with them. And others, such as the Ada Lovelace Institute or the, or, um, the Health Foundations, are also playing a key role on, on the patient and public uh, perspective as well. And finally, uh, just to mention that uh, this is a piece of work that we've been doing really to bring the nations together and, and recommend uh, an harmonized approach. Uh, we need to keep an eye on what's happening as well out there um, outside of the UK. 
And so obviously there have been some recent news on the, the work that has been going on out in internationally. For instance, the WHO has just released the largest global collections of health inequality data, but they are definitely relying on how the countries collect that data. And there will be a lot of inconsistencies there. Mentioning the clinical trials, the NIH have been working on diversity of clinical trials. So can we learn something from them? And really this push of col around collection of ethnicity data that is even not allowed in some countries. So how do we go about that? So just to keep uh, an eye on what is happening and how we can learn from others. So I'm just um, finishing here, probably Ruth, um, uh, but just to say that we'll be, we'll be uh, finalizing the recommendations and publish uh, an article, and then we will work with some Alliance members to see how we can implement some of these. And we'll also work with some organizations to develop guidance for healthcare professionals and um, with others as well to look at the work on transparency because the public perception is key to this work. And I think I'll stop there and happy to answer any question or even follow up after this meeting. Thank you so much, Paolo. It's really great to hear an update on all of that amazing work. Um, I know if there are any questions for Paola and Ashley, please do put them in the um, Q&A function and we'll get to them in a few moments. Um, Eleanor and Mike have been uh, furiously working away at all of the questions that have come in. I can see they've already answered about 12, which is amazing. Um, there are a couple here that have been um, upvoted. So um, I'll start with those if that's okay. Um, there's, a, there's a question at the top about um, is ethnicity data typically self-reported within health services? Is that true across the record or was there a certain point at which self-reporting was implemented? Um, and I'm assuming that that is for um, CPRD, but open to all of our um, panel, members, panel, panel members to answer. Hi. Um, the answer to that is there's really no way to know. Um, the, um, obviously it would be ideal if every time someone was recording ethnicity, be it in primary care or secondary care, that the healthcare provider turned to the patient and ask explicitly, what do you define your ethnicity to be? How would you classify yourself? And then enter that into the record. Um, we have no way of knowing if that is actually what happens or whether the healthcare provider simply enters a value based on their assumption when they see a patient. Um, we would assume that in primary care, more often it is self-reported. When you register with a GP, typically you fill in a little form and one of the questions on that form is typically what is your ethnicity? Um, so we would assume that primary care data is more likely to be self-reported than necessarily data from secondary care. But again, there is no way of knowing actually what happened uh, in order to have a record um, entered into a patient's file, so. Okay. Paula, did you want to out. add? Um, oh, and Ashley, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I'll hand over to Ashley, actually, uh, definitely can tell more. Uh, I just want just a consideration to say that in the public and patient work that we did, there was a strong view that it, we don't know about whether everybody does it self-reported, but the public was really keen that it is self-reported. So just that that I wanted to mention, but yes, I, I yeah completely agree with what Eleanor said. I don't know, Ashley, if you wanted to add. Yeah, just to add, really, one of our one of our key stakeholders who came to our um, in person workshop kind of took it upon himself to go and do a bit of an investigation. So um, he's a senior a senior national clinical lead across NHS England, and he went out and spoke to some GPs, some secondary care consultants, some nurses, some people in the community, and and basically the feedback he got was we we don't know, um, and that's essentially why one of the recommendations we will now be putting out as part of the work that Paula uh, mentioned is. Um, better communication and transparency around who is actually collecting data. So whether that's metadata standards or whether that's better documentation from the multiple different sources of data that's available. But I think it's also about um, clarity for the people who are collecting data. So the primary data collection points, whether that's in primary care, secondary care, to understand the importance of if we're reporting that it's 
uh, patient or individual reported information, it needs to come from the patient or the individual. It can't be recorded down on their behalf without asking them. So that's one of our key recommendations that's going to be coming out soon. Amazing. Thank, thank you all. Um, we don't know, essentially. Um, another another question that's been upvoted um, that's, that's um, just come in as well. What are the sorts of um, timelines when people are applying to access um, CPRD data? Do you have any information about that? Eleanor, shall I pick up on that one? OK, so from the point of submission of what we call a research data governance, uh, application into our electronic research application portal it's 30 working days to receive a review and that could be an acceptance or it could be that there's an amendment or that it's been rejected and needs to be rethought and then resubmitted the 30 working days is the standard brilliant thank you no, nice and easy one um there's also one at the um at the top of the q a that's got a, a second up vote um is the ethnicity data available in CPRD data extracts or standard, or is there an additional payment for it? And if we currently have a, a, requ a request in for CPRD ARUM and HES data, is there a, a way that we can define the ethnicity ourselves using the technique? So the answer to that is, yeah. yeah, the answer to that is, there is an additional payment for the ethnicity record data set. Um, that is because a lot of work went into creating, um, defining ethnicity and categorizing ethnicity and algorithm development for ethnicity. Um, and of course, um, that work needs to be recouped. Uh, we are a not-for-profit, so uh, that time and effort has to be recouped. But the answer to, could you define it yourself? Absolutely, yep. The um, data that you receive from CPRD um, and from HES, the ethnicity, the raw data for ethnicity is still in those data sets that you received. Um, you would have to do the work yourself, of course, of defining it um, and coming up with an algorithm for figuring out what uh, records you're going to use and categorizing the codes and all that sort of thing. Um, our, our method is detailed in our publication. Of course, if you recreate it yourself, it's not guaranteed to give the same results as us, um, the data set that we provide. Um, so even if you attempt to use a similar methodology um, based on our work, uh, you can't then say that your work is generalized or comparable to studies that have used the official data set um, because your methods might be slightly different. Your coding might be slightly different. Your categorization of codes would be slightly different. Um, those sorts of things. Um, so yeah, you absolutely can. The data is still there. We, do, we haven't purged ethnicity data from the raw data sets. It's still there. You can absolutely do it yourself. Um, it's a lot of work. But if that's the way you want to go, that is still an option available to you. However, using the data set that we have created saves you that time and effort and also allows your study to be comparable to other studies that have used our data set as well. Uh, Thank Ruth, you so much. Just to, just to say our data fees are available on our website at cprd.com, publicly available. Perfect. And I know there's been a question about recording and slides and information. We will follow up after we finish with all the necessary um, resources that we've been talking about today. And I know we're at time, but I just want to finish up with um, uh, one question um, uh, directed at Paola and Ashley, but um, everyone everyone can chip in if they like. Um, I wondered what, what's next for the, um, the coding standards uh, diversity in, in data group and where where we go now with um, ethnicity data what's the next step in implementing the recommendations so maybe I start and then Ashley uh, if you if you want to uh, finish as well uh, so I guess one of the clear next steps is definitely definitely revise, uh, revising the recommendations that we're writing and we're doing that with the community actually who are participating in the working group so it's them the experts who actually are refining those 
I think after um, we publish the paper, we will go definitely to the Alliance Council and we will present that paper to decision makers. And I guess the NHS uh, is our next step. So definitely we will be trying to work with them to look at, to look at how we can involve clinicians and uh, write up and co-develop a guidance uh, for the professional working in this space. So that's one of the clear next steps. Ashley, I don't know if you want to um, add anything. Yeah, I, I just say that the, the UK is probably has the, the greatest wealth of links data in probably everywhere in the world at the moment. And whilst ethnicity as a research topic and a data challenge isn't something new, I think the COVID pandemic brought it to the forefront. And I would say there's a, a lot of fantastic work going on. CPRD have talked today, and I'm also aware of lots of work going across uh, the other devolved nations. I guess for me, it's the, the recommendations paper to see how we can continue to use the data that's already been captured, but then potentially influence policy and frameworks moving forward to understand how that uh, improvement of metadata and, and data collection can proceed. And to a couple of the points that have been asked in the Q&A today, I think it's really important to make sure that we continue to keep data as granular as possible when it comes to the primary data collection. We don't want to lose that granularity. But how can we enable further harmonized reproducible methods with transparency so that where groups want to come in and access existing knowledge, they can do that as readily as possible if the methods and the harmonization that's been done fits their specific study design. But being cautious that in some cases, uh, certain study designs might require higher granularity than it's available in some of the methodology. So it's it's trying to find that balance, really, that we uh, we fit uh, as many studies as possible whilst ensuring we don't uh, limit the opportunities for others in the future. I'll just um, uh, let Mike and Eleanor chip in if they wish to, and I know we're um, uh, beyond time, but if there's anything else that you wanted to add. Uh, I think I'll just say, Ruth, thank you very much for the opportunity to just raise awareness. I can see some requests for more information, so we look forward to getting some inquiries. Um, Thank you very much. Oh, you're most welcome. Thank you all for being um, our guest speakers and our, our guest panel members today. Um, and just to say, I did pop a note in the chat that um, we've had quite a lot of questions come in as we were doing the Q&A as well. So anything that we haven't been able to answer now live, we will make sure to gather those answers for everybody offline and then share that in the materials um, in our in our follow up. So any question that hasn't been answered, I'm really sorry, but we will make every effort to answer it afterwards and, and share that as well as as um along with the recording and, and the slides and the various links that we've shared. Um, and I think at that point, since I'm about four or five minutes over our, our time slot, um, just to say a massive thank you to all of our guest speakers. Super interesting topics today. It's been really, really great. Um, and thank you to everybody else for coming along and um, asking some um, brilliant questions. Thank you so much. and We'll see you uh, next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye now.